I have always had a love-hate relationship with exercise. Try as I might to avoid it, I understand the value of it. It makes you healthier, happier, full of endorphins and like glistening with sweat like the girls on Baywatch. <laughs> you know, uh, sweat does not look good on me though. <laughs> I've considered myself fat since puberty. <laughs> Before that, I was a willowy, athletic, all skin knees and skinny legs. I rode the rocking horse in my basement for hours listening to this old 60s Batman soundtrack, imagining myself charging across meadows on rescue missions or escaping at breakneck speed from evildoers like the Penguin or that uh, fat Egyptian guy played by Victor Buono. <laughs> I loved, I loved to run around the neighborhood pretending to be a horse my auburn mane flowing behind me as I galloped from corner to corner. <laughs> I'm sure the neighbors wondered if I had some kind of disorder. Maybe I did. I don't know. But around the age of 11, I stopped running. I stopped being a horse. I stopped being active at all, in fact. I, I sat on my front porch and read whenever I could. I read on my bed, I read on the couch, I read on the floor, in the bathtub, and in school when I got bored, except in English class, because we read in there. I fell in love with books and was consumed by the magic of stories that transported me to faraway lands like Narnia and Middle Earth and summer camp with cool kids like Donna Parker. That was my social life, and these were my friends. Now, <laughs> why I stopped being a horse, stopped engaging with my physical body at all, in fact, was because a teacher in the fourth grade in Catholic school took advantage of my nerdiness to fiddle with my body. At age 11, my mind didn't even know what that meant. I was just flattered. But my body, the primal guardian we all carry with us through this life, knew. And it shut that shit down by locking the body inside the mind and packing on layers of fat like protective armor. Abruptly, I went from active kid to porch potato. It was not a conscious choice. My mind had ascertained that I was at fault, that my body was at fault, that it must be kept under guard at all times to avoid other tragedies. This was a program playing behind the scenes in my brain, not something I had any awareness of at that time. Being inside a physical body had made me a target, so, the safest thing to do was pretend like I didn't have a body at all. Now, my parents didn't know anything about this, of course. This was the late 60s, and the conversation we now have with kids about you know, stranger danger and your no-no square, um, these, those had not occurred yet. So they pushed me to engage with my body, the body I unconsciously rejected. There was church kickball where my shitty eyesight and extra pounds doomed me to fail. How can you kick a ball you can't really see? It didn't, it didn't help that one of the other moms at our first game yelled out, get that fat girl off the field, she can't kick. And I heard it, and my mom heard it, and she did not make me play kick a ball after that. Uh -uh. My unconscious campaign against my body continued for years, but I cleverly found ways to sabotage any attempt at improvements. My mom signed me up for summer classes at the YMCA, gymnastics. I got to do oil painting too, but I had to accept the gymnastics class as part of the deal because my mom wanted me to get physically fit. 
there were about 40 girls in this gymnastics class. So we did everything as a group, lining up to take our turn at the pommel horse or the balance beam. A couple of us who hated exercise as much strategize that if we shuffled in line and suddenly kept moving back a few people at a time, we'd eventually end up behind the person who'd gone first, thus eliminating our need to vault or balance or cartwheel. <laughs> now, by junior high, I had gotten really exceptional at avoiding physical activities. I had been in Catholic school till ninth grade, and Catholic school PE was just walking sluggishly around an open field. <laughs> totally my speed. No showering required. But public junior high school was different. Miss Troyes Wood, an imposing figure in Bermuda shorts and an assortment of crocheted vests for every occasion, was our instructor. Her wire-stiff salt-and-pepper hair was cut short, her face leathery from years of semi-professional golf and women's league baseball. Now, Mrs. Wood forced us to climb ropes, play volleyball, dodgeball. Her steely eyes found every slacker, every cheater, every line lingerer in the gym, so there was no escaping her demands. And Sheila Fillinger, a very angry, pale girl with long black hair, threatened to beat me up every day in the unmonitored locker room to the point where I preferred to stink all day rather than risk being naked in the shower where Sheila could shiv me and let my blood go down the drain undetected. <laughs> oh, once again, having a body seemed damned inconvenient. Now by this point, I had efficiently repressed any memory of my fourth grade teacher who had been fired mid-school year under mysterious circumstances. I had no real idea until much later in my life that my hatred of all things physical stemmed from a very real incident. I chalked up my avoidance to clumsiness, early breast development, extra weight, the discomfort of sweating, no adult ever thought to ask, so I kept tooling around in my meat prison, <laughs> treating my mind like a princess and my body like a pauper. My high school started in 10th grade. Now, when I found out that I could choose which PE class I wanted to take, I was rapturous. They had bowling. <laughs> The school was within walking distance of the bowling alley. And Mr. Doty, a man shaped exactly like the letter S, <laughs> escorted us on a leisurely stroll over to the 20th century lanes where we had about 15 minutes to bowl before we had to walk back to school. It was the best. And for the record, yes, I, I suck at bowling too. In the second semester of 10th grade, I had to tape something other than bowling. So I saw gymnastics listed in this catalog. And when I asked the counselor about it, he said it was just a class about nutrition and healthy eating and stuff like that. All girls. So I figured maybe that would be a more academic way to get my PE credit. So I signed up with Mrs. Corrine Brown. On the first day of gymnastics, we were told to sit in the gym bleachers, the first three rows, and out walked Mrs. Corrine Brown, a thin woman with a severely short haircut, <laughs> wearing a red windbreaker and a tracksuit to match. I felt a little pang in my gut, a slight tinge of fear. If a very thin, athletic woman was teaching this class, wouldn't she expect us to do things? I'd been hoping for a tired, middle-aged lady in cat eye glasses who'd give us low-fat recipes and pep talks. <laughs> Mrs. Brown paced before us, the silent herd of 30 young girls. And then she crossed her arms, rocked back on her heels, and said, y'all are fat. Our, our collective eyes darted side to side and we looked at each other for salvation and none came. Silence. She continued. 
When y'all hold up your arms, you got these big old flaps underneath like chicken wings. She held up one of her own skinny arms and gestured to underarm fat flaps that she clearly did not have. Y'all look like a bunch of old ladies. You are in slamnastics now. That means you're going to slam down. We are going to get weighed every week, and you fitting to lose them bingo wings. Well, I didn't even know I had bingo wings. I didn't know if I wanted to lose them. At our next gym period, Mrs. Brown tested our strength and endurance. 25 jumping jacks, she yelled. And we all stumbled around like marshmallows in T-shirts. I did about three, and I started to feel it. Now, to be fair, I have little short Tyrannosaurus Rex arms. So anything where my arms go over my head feels unsafe. So I stopped at 10. Mrs. Brown sauntered up to me, sizing me up. She said, why'd you stop? I'm tired, I answered, out of breath. Maybe I exaggerated just a little bit. All the other girls were doing ragdoll jumping jacks, like barely lifting their arms, but they continued and watched me to see what would happen. Mrs. Brown thought for a minute, crossed her arms, and did a quick circle around me before yelling, all right, ladies, somebody stopped. So we start all over. Give me 25 jumping jacks. Oh, jeez. I, I had not anticipated this at all. All the other girls stared daggers at me. <laughs> Especially Velma Ulmer, a girl who had beat me up once in front of our elementary school because she didn't like my shoes. I wished for the millionth time that I was just a brain. Like in the old Star Trek episode where aliens had evolved to totally jettison their bodies. They were just lumpy lobes under a dome doomed to betting on the fights of physical beings who were captured for their amusement. That's what I wanted. I wanted to be just a brain, a brain that Velma could not punch. Well, back in gymnastics, we just kept trying. I don't think I lost any weight, but it did get a little easier to do the jumping jacks and to run laps around the gym. I'd settled into something of a rhythm, and Mrs. Brown became less brutal in her assessments of our flappy arm fat. But then, team sports reared their ugly, its ugly head, volleyball. <laughs> Teams were chosen at random by the teacher to ensure that nobody got left out or picked last. And as luck would have it, I ended up on Velma's team. Mrs. Brown also assigned us our positions, which rotated with every turn. I was at the net for the first round, which meant it would be my duty to spike the ball if it got close to me. I wasn't very tall, and I couldn't jump very high, and I had those T-Rex arms. So <laughs> spiking was not a duty I felt confident about. As we shuffled around waiting for the torture to begin, Velma sidled up to me and whispered in my ear, you better spike that ball or I will punch you. <laughs> I felt a red flush creep up my neck and into my face and my heart beat faster than it should. I flashed on being that, that young girl running around the neighborhood, wind in my hair, my mind and body integrated and free to do anything. How it felt to jump and dance and run in a body that was still part of myself. That was gone. Now I acutely felt the weight conspiring with gravity to keep me rooted to the gym floor. My arms were useless noodles. My head pounded and my vision blurred. I prayed really hard that nobody pitched that volleyball into a spikeable position. My Prayers were misheard, apparently, <laughs> because almost immediately the ball flew toward me, barely clearing the net. Time slowed down, like it does in car accidents and murder montages. As if from outside my body, I saw my fist swing back, like in that old um, TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man. 
You know, that was a... And as I tried to connect with the spinning white orb, I felt Velma's eyes drilling into my shoulder. Slowly, slowly my fist approached the ball. I connected, I hit it, but it just dribbled down the net like baby food dribbling out of a toddler's mouth. And it hit the gym floor with a thud. Of course, I thought, of course my body betrayed me. Mrs. Brown's sinus splitting whistle paused the game while their server retrieved the ball and we all rotated positions again with me taking one shaky step to the right, putting me on the end. Velma rotated away from me, but I could still feel her death stare. The whistle blew again and we started another volley. I pushed my thick glasses up so I could see better and waited. The other team's server threw the ball in the air and punched. It flew straight down the middle, sailed over the net, went straight to Velma, who open-palmed it to me. I had no time to think. I, I saw this globe of doom spinning toward me, and I instinctively flailed my arms in the air, hoping to connect. And to my great surprise, I did. I flawlessly propelled that ball across the net into an unguarded gap, and it hit the floor. I know. Cheers erupted from the side. Mrs. Brown whistle stopped us. Time to get dressed, she said. As we walked toward the locker room, I got pats on the back and smiles from some of the other girls. I grinned sheepishly, feeling guilty taking credit for something that was essentially me having a lucky seizure in midair. <laughs> a hand on my shoulder stopped me and I turned. It was Velma. Bracing for a smack for my previous lack of spiking ability, I was surprised when she said, good job, good job on that return. <laughs> Stunned, I made my way back to the locker room to get out of the sweaty gym clothes. I wondered for a moment if maybe I did actually have athletic ability hidden under layers of underarm fat. I did not. <laughs> it was the first moment since the fourth grade where I didn't actively hate my body. Now, I did not understand any of this till much later in life, of course, after lots of therapy. <laughs> Although I started to make peace with my body, I constantly yearned for a life where I was just a brain. And to this day, I sometimes still feel that way. <laughs> but to tell you how far I have come, despite what you may see, <laughs> I just earned my yellow sash in Kung Fu. And you know, although I haven't become very good at it yet, I love the power of feeling that I've reconnected to my body, at least a little. <laughs> Laura Preble, everyone. Laura Preble.